about seven or eight years ago, my marriage ended. My wife and I split up. Our kids were four and six years old at the time, and it was hard on them. It was also hard on me. It was devastating. It was heartbreaking. I had to confront really deep feelings of failure and inadequacy. But I'm an adult. I could handle it. I had autonomy. I had agency. I knew that my actions had contributed to the situation and that I had a say in the final outcome. My children, however, they had no choices. Their whole world was reconfiguring itself, and they were just along for the ride, forced to adapt to whatever came their way. Can you imagine how hard that must have been? Just thinking about their sense of helplessness still upsets me. From the very beginning, my ex-wife and I shared custody. My children spent half their time with their mother and the other half with me. And when they were with me, parenting was my priority. Fatherhood was my identity. First and foremost, I was dad. And that meant I was committed to helping them deal with the difficulty of divorce. I was going to guide them as they became accustomed to their new lives. I was going to mentor them, not only as they learned to accept a changing definition of family, but also an entirely new set of formative experiences. I was going to talk them through this. I was going to hold their hands. I was going to hug them. I was going to offer them my love, my support. But they only wanted to play video games. Video games all day long. They would sit on the sofa, thumbs on their controllers, eyes fixed on the screen, shooting, running, jumping, sounds like a casino, beeping, ringing, buzzing, lights flashing. My kids were enraptured. They were immersed. They were obsessed. And I very quickly recognized that if I were to tell them to stop playing, if I told them to get up off the sofa and come on a hike to process their feelings about the divorce, <laughs> they were going to perceive that as punishment. Games were like their security blanket. Home life had become chaotic and confusing, but games had consistent rules. Games were dependable. Games were predictable. I didn't want to take that away from them. So I met my kids where they were. I sat down beside them on the sofa, and I played along. New Super Mario Brothers, Donkey Kong Country, Daddy became a gamer, and digital play became the new family time. I can see that some of you are cringing. <laughs> Most people react that way at first. Negative, shocked, the new family time. That's absurd, you think. Blasphemous, even. We are so committed to the industrial age concept of the nuclear family that a digital device seems more like an intruder than some kind of a domestic enhancement. Smartphones, laptops, iPads, gaming consoles, these things feel toxic like a trespasser. They bring what once belonged outside, inside our homes. I'm sure every parent watching this has had this experience, sitting in the living room, trying to get your child's attention, but the kids would rather chat with friends on Discord, swipe through TikTok, post a selfie on Instagram, update the Facebook status. Their minds are out there, but their bodies are in here. And for grown-ups, and parents, that's really confusing. What was once kept at arm's reach is now deeply enmeshed in even the most intimate parts of our lives. A digital device in your back pocket, under your pillow, even in the bathroom. There's no respite, no boundaries. There's no longer an easy way to protect your children from the external universe. But I'm here to tell you that that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a different thing. Our world is changing. We all know that. Automation, bioengineering, artificial intelligence, the fourth industrial revolution. You've heard all of that before. Everything is transforming. And every day, we're forced to confront unfamiliar things. Childhood is one of those things. Childhood is changing. And it's scary, and it's disconcerting. Because it's difficult to figure out how to prepare your kids for a future that you don't understand, for a world that you can only barely imagine. But guess what? Nobody's ever been able to predict the future. Every parent has always faced the exact same challenge. You might think we're living at a time of unique revolutionary change, but we're not. 
Every generation deals with the same thing. In ancient times, the philosopher Heraclitus, he said that change is the only constant. All entities flow and nothing stands still, he said. But he was wrong, because there's one thing that I can think of that does stand still, technophobia. Humans are always conflicted when it comes to the future. We love what's new, but we're terrified of change. We reach out for modernity, as long as it doesn't have too much momentum. We want all the benefits of advancement, but not any of the uncertainty that comes along with it. And that's why, throughout history, the march of human progress has been consistently met with technophobia. Take Socrates, for example, that brilliant philosopher of ancient Athens. He practically invented critical thinking. He practically invented rational thought, but he was scared of writing. He was scared of words on a page. That was his version of technophobia. We sometimes forget that the written word was once cutting-edge technology, an innovation greater and more disruptive than anything we've seen in millennia. The iPhone is nothing compared to the written word. It's not even a contest. And Socrates knew that. He warned us about the dangers of this terrifying alphabet technology. He said, words on a page were going to ruin our memory. He said, people were going to stop having face-to-face -face conversations and that our capacity for nuanced communication would be forever lost. Sound familiar? <laughs> Today's parents are just like Socrates, resisting a changing world, trying to stop what's new. But fighting the future won't bring back the past. No, it just fills the present with unbearable anxiety. It creates unnecessary tension and stress. And whenever I talk to grown-ups, this is the hardest thing for them to hear. The way that you are currently thinking about technology is bad for your kids. You're asking them to reconcile the inevitability of the future with your idealistic memories, with your fond but false fantasies of the past. And that's not only impossible, it's foolish, because your childhood wasn't perfect. Nobody's was. You may want to believe that it was natural and essential, but it wasn't. That's just nostalgia talking. Nostalgia comes from the ancient Greek word nostos, meaning homecoming or return to home. And that's what you really want. You want to return to home. But the home that you remember isn't what home has always been. Wooden toys, family dinners, Barbie dolls, every single one of these things is unique to a certain historical era. These are trends, these are fads. There were no playgrounds before the 19th century, there were no sandboxes, there were no jump ropes, and there were barely any toys. The childhood that you are so desperately trying to preserve was unique to the industrial era. It was a single blip in time. And you are not helping your children by asking them to live like artifacts in a mummified past. That's not parenting. No, children need grown-ups to hold their hands and show them how to walk courageously into the future. The same way we do when we teach them to cross the street. We don't let our children cross the street alone until we know that they're going to look both ways and then yield to oncoming traffic. So why do we hand them an iPad or a smartphone without first making sure they know how to use it safely? And why do we blame the technology if they don't? That doesn't make sense. That's not right. That's the technophobia, and it's grounded in a fear of loss. It's a fear that our kids might get so seduced by the future that they're going to forget all about the past. We're scared that they'll abandon the old ideas, the old human wis wisdom. We're scared that they'll abandon things, essential things, like ethics and compassion and kindness, what's always been passed from one generation to the next. How do we make sure these things remain relevant and meaningful and applicable to a connected world? How do we preserve the ideas and values that make it possible for humans to live together in community, to build societies and civilizations? This is what we're really talking about when we talk about social skills, when we talk about collaboration, when we talk about executive function, when we talk about self-regulation. When we're worried about these things, when we worry 
that digital technology gets in the way of these things, this is what we're worried about losing. But we are wrong to worry. Or at least we're wrong to scapegoat the technology. And I'll tell you why. There is at least 100 years' worth of child development research telling us that these skills, these aptitudes, these human values are developed through play. Play between peers, back and forth interactions, serve and return interactions, not only between friends, but also between grown-ups and children. Researchers know that this is true. It's conclusive. It's considered a fact at this point, and pretty much any adult you talk to accepts the fact that play is good for kids. But we sometimes forget that there's no such thing as neutral play. There's no Garden of Eden playground somewhere where everything's pure and perfect. No, play always looks different. Play has always been changing. In fact, everything about childhood has always been situated in certain contexts. A sandbox is a context. A classroom is a context. And social media, video games, and online platforms are also contexts. These are the new contexts, the new playgrounds, the new places where our children need our guidance and our support. Support that we cannot provide if we turn away from a digital future. Support that we cannot provide if we limit our children's opportunities to experiment and explore and innovate with these new tools. No, we need to teach them to be creative and artistic and active in a digital world. And this is why I've spent all the years since my divorce showing parents and teachers and caregivers how to pick up the game controller and play with your kids. Text with them, use social media, get involved, go digital, accept your children's online lives, and teach them how to live those lives mindfully. Every day, I get messages from people who have read my book, The New Childhood, moms and dads who have changed their attitude from resistance to acceptance, from censoring to mentoring, from limits to guidance. And each one tells me how much happier their families became. Each one tells me how so many of the problems that they used to blame on technology eventually just dissolved and disappeared. They tell me how their children's eyes lit up when they sat down beside them on the sofa and said, how does this game work? How do you play it? Show me why you like it. Teach me what to do. Let's watch YouTube together. Please share what you care about with me. One mom told me how after years of struggle, she finally surrendered. She just stopped fighting, and when her son turned 15, he sold his PlayStation because he was bored of it. Video games didn't ruin his life. They didn't make him lazy. Eventually, he just outgrew them, like I outgrew bubblegum and knock-knock jokes. Another parent spent a week playing Minecraft with her six-year-old son, and she told me that taking part in his pleasure was revelatory. She said she learned what makes him tick, what makes him smile, and she could tell that he felt understood. This is what it takes to parent in a connected world. This is what our children need. No, actually, this is what everyone needs. Everywhere around the world, grown-ups too, parents and folks without kids, it is critical, it is urgent. We must prepare the next generation to use digital technologies in ways that promote peace and love and respect and dignity. We must raise them to thrive in a connected world. And that means recognizing that this is not about limits or balance. It's not about screen time. You can't manage this with an on-off switch mentality. No, our children need help learning how to live well, learning how to live a good life with the tools of the times. They need to see the technologies of a connected world as instruments they command, as instruments of empowerment. They need to know that tools don't use us, we use them. If life were like a video game, then our job would be to set up our kids to beat the levels that we couldn't beat, to overcome the obstacles that shut us down. We need to pass them the controllers. But first, 
We need to teach them everything we've learned about how to play the game. Thank you.